All right, this morning we're going to get specifically into Latina and Latino uh, theology in the United States. We'll talk a little bit about um, the history of that and um, recent events and then move into one primary theological contribution and, and touch very briefly on a few others. Initially, we do need to consider the way that Christianity was brought to the Americas. Um, of course, that is through conquest. Um, you're probably familiar with um, Christopher Columbus sailing the ocean blue in 1492. Um, he landed in the Bahamas. And although we uh, celebrate... Well, the nation commemorates um, Columbus Day um, on some level. Um, he was actually a horrific um, person to the indigenous peoples here in the United States, in the Americas in general, I should say. Um, I've posted a link in Blackboard to, actually it's a comic through the oatmeal um, that highlights some of the history of uh, Columbus and then offers up Bartholomew de las Casas, who was a priest in the Americas who fought for the rights of indigenous peoples against um, the violence and the hatred of the conquest and some of the theology that supported it. Um, so I encourage you, it's, it's a brief comic it will give you um, more details on some of the activity of Columbus and those like him, including requiring the indigenous peoples to dig for gold and bring them gold. And if they didn't, um, he would cut off their hand and make them wear it around their necks as a sign to others to make sure to find plenty of gold. Um, he also is known to have cut off um, their ears, um, so pretty gruesome tactics. Um, but again, the comic highlights Bartholomew de las Casas, the priest um, who wrote some beautiful things about the indigenous peoples um, having the image of God within them and being equals um, in that sense, having a soul, having reason and rationality and freedom and free will in the same way that the Spanish do. And so he was spent his career um, trying to get the church and Spain to treat the indigenous peoples with dignity. Um, so it is really worth looking at that uh, comic. We don't read anymore, but De Las Casas in this class because we, we focus on those writing in the United States. And he was working in, in the Caribbean primarily. Um, we do read him in another class if you're interested. All right, um, so I just wanted to highlight one note uh, from Columbus so that you can see how intertwined and sort of mixed up and conflated this mission of conquest of the new world, so-called, um, how it mixed up it was with theology and people's understanding of the mission of the church at the time. As I already noted, that De Las Casas was fighting against these ideas, and there were theologians who were writing um, in approval of the domination and enslavement of indigenous peoples here. So there were Christian theologians working to argue for the oppression and enslavement of people, and De Las Casas was trying to combat that. But here in um, Columbus's journal, he wrote, From here, one might send in the name of the Holy Trinity as many slaves as could be sold, right? So in the name of God, in the name of the Holy Trinity, here we come to this place and we find all of these people that don't have modern weapons and we can dominate them and sell them into slavery however we choose. Praise Jesus, right? So this is, um, this is how messy it is immediately with the way the indigenous peoples were treated in the name of God. More specifically um, to Mexico, 
is Hernan Cortez. And um, I mentioned him because some of our readers, I mean, some of our readings, well, at least one, the Elizondo reading is particular to the Mexican-American context. Um, and obviously many of, um, well, Mexico has a particular um, relationship to the U.S., so it's, it's particularly relevant. Um, so when Hernan Cortez um, landed on what is now Mexico um, coast, he was greeted, potentially, there's different accounts, but with, with some greeting and some welcome, he was given gold and he was given women slaves. Um, we can talk about gender issues another time, but he was given a number of women, I think around 20, um, and one of these women was a woman who has come to be known as La Malinche, and she is a prominent figure and archetype in Mexican history today. You'll find her image on statues and a variety of, and used in a variety of ways all over the place. Um, she became a translator for him, very smart woman, right? She learns English so she can translate between in Nahual, the Aztec language, and um, in English. But sometimes she is considered a traitor because her translation assisted um, Cortez in defeating the Aztec Empire and taking um, over Mexico and obviously um, to the detriment of the Aztec people living there. Um, it didn't take long for them to defeat the Aztecs and to take their their primary city, uh, Tenochtitlan, um, which then becomes the capital of this new nation, Mexico City. Um, Cortez also sees his action here as um, a mission given to him by God. Um, as he says... We carried the flag of the cross and fought for our faith. God gave us so much victory that we killed many people. So again, um, the way that the violence of the conquest um, and those who came um, in the name, believing themselves to be coming in the name of God on some mission from God for the sake of the church, um, at least that's what they told themselves, really understood this as being something that God was giving them and granting them, including um, the murder and violent domination of um, millions of people in the Americas. So, here is um, one image of um, Our Lady of Guadalupe, La Morentia. Notice that she has this black bow around her waist. Um, that was a sign in Aztec culture of you being with child. So there are these elements of... Um, of her that speak directly to Aztec culture. Um, we didn't go into how this image appeared. I suppose I should have. It ends up um, being a sort of found in Juan Diego's cloak. She, the bishop asks for a sign that he really saw um, Our Lady and so she says, pick up these roses, and it was winter, so, and there's roses that don't even really belong and aren't native to Mexico, but he picks up all these roses and puts them in his cloak, and this, these roses are going to be the sign to the bishop, right? And there's roses in the middle of December, and where, does, where could these roses have come from? And so he dumps out the roses um, for the bishop, and then inside that cloak is this image, and there is... Um, a cloak in um, in Mexico, sit outside Mexico City, where um, this apparition um, occurred, that that has it, so you can go and and see it, and it's a very important pilgrimage site 
Um, so there is still this cloak with this image. All right, I wanted to cover some terms. Uh, if, you've, if you've already done the reading, you know that, um, that Latina and Latino theologians often use Spanish terms to, uh, to make um, their unique theological contribution. We saw this also, if you think back to womanism and African-American women's theology and their choice of the word womanism or womanist um, to characterize their or identify their particular form of doing theology and how that comes from the black folk expression, according to Alice Walker, you're acting womanish, right? Meaning grown. So womanism selects a word from cultural folk usage. And we find something very similar here with Latina and Latina theologians using language um, that is rich from their culture and, and using it as a, um, a, con a unique contribution to the theological discipline. So here I have a list of terms. And before that, I have a um, basically the hierarchy of classes and races in um, Latin America historically and still to this day. So I wanted to highlight that because it is significant. Um, obviously, historically, and we're talking specifically initially about the colonial era uh, when Mexico was known as New Spain. Um, the Spanish, those who were from Spain, were the ruling class. The um, country was ruled by a viceroy, and the viceroy would come from Spain for a term right, and then go back to Spain and a new voice where it would come. So that was ruled fully by people born in Spain, from Spain. A criollo is someone who is 100% Spanish blood. So there has been no mixing. Um, so they are 100% Spanish, but they were born in New Spain or Mexico. So you would be a lower class citizen at that point, having not come from the motherland, if you will. Below the criolla is one who is mestizo or mestiza. Um, you should be quite familiar with that term by now um, if you did the reading. Um, and that is someone who is specifically, most likely we're talking about Indian or indigenous and Spanish. So um, they're, you know, immediately, you know, Cortez and La Malinche had a son, for example, and some call that son the first mestizo. And this becomes what really ultimately, especially throughout the revolution in Mexico, becomes represented of, of being Mexican. To be Mexican is to be mestizo, to be mixed, um, not to be 100% Spanish anymore. Um, but to be mixed of Spanish and in Indio. So this, you begin to see how this becomes problematic, certainly for those who are still 100% Indio. Those who are still indigenous um, aren't even considered um, you know, characteristic of Mexican identity anymore. To be Mexican is to be mixed. Um, and, well, and so historically, um, to be mestizo was to be lower um, eventually to be mestizo is to be um, the dominating or ruling class in Mexico. Granted throughout Latin America still to this day to be lighter skinned is still um, to some extent preferable to be darker skinned typically means you are more indigenous and the indigenous peoples are those who experience um, the most oppression and racism in Latin America. Um, and that's throughout Latin America. So there's still this color issue um, still rooted in, in race or cultural um, domination. So that would be um, the indigenous peoples. And lastly, um, would be someone who is of African descent, negra, negro, not having the same um, racist connotation in and of itself in the term 
um, in Latin America as as we um, have that history of the use of the term here in the United States. Um, so that's um, the basic hierarchy of race that really still persists largely throughout Latin America. Um, and some terms that I wanted to highlight, Chicana and Chicano, um, this refers to Mexican Americans. So these could be Mexican American immigrants, but primarily Chicano or Chicana refers to people who happen to have some sort of Mexican ancestry, but are born in the U.S., very much, you know, U.S. citizens, American, but also have that history or some sort of ancestry. Um, I asked you to read a poem by a very famous Chicana poet, literary theorist, um, truly very influential and well-known, named Gloria Anzaldúa. Um, she's known as a Chicana poet. Um, so there's a um, realm of literature and critical study that is Chicana studies. Um, yeah. Uh, to be Tejano or Tejana is to be from Texas. Um, in a few minutes, we'll talk about some of the history of Texas and the history of the southwestern United States. And you'll see that those, who, uh, if you know anyone from Texas, um, you know that um, they have, there's a, a unique kind of pride um, for those who are from Texas. And if I don't know if I've seen it here when I was in graduate school. Those graduate students who came uh, to Princeton from Texas would always fly like their Texas flag from their balconies and so on. So there's this sense of if you're from Texas, for a while there, you were your own independent country. And so they identify as Texan. And, and there are, of course, many families who were in Texas, um, long before it became part of the United States, um, it was part of Mexico, and then it claimed its independence. Um, so there are Tejanos whose family has been Tejano for five, six generations. You know, so um, so Tejano refers specifically to someone from with that sort of ancestry. It really identifies with that region of the country. Hispanic generally just refers to someone who is um, Spanish-speaking country, though it doesn't typically refer to someone from Spain. Obviously, Latin America also includes, um, well, an English-speaking country, Belize, because it was colonized by the British. Um, but also, primarily Portuguese is another major language, obviously, Brazil. So those countries that were um, colonized and part of other empires um, France had a colony, um, Brazil, um, Portuguese, but Hispanic specifically refers to Spanish speaking. Um, mestizaje is just refers generally to mixing, the mixing of blood and culture. Mestizo, mestizo refers to the person, the individual who is of mixed blood and descent. Mulato, mulata, um, this, um, again, is not a term that has the same sort of negative connotations in um, Latin America as it might in the United States. Obviously, this means a mixing that includes um, African descent. And um, mulates refers to that mixing. So um, it gets that specific. And in fact, the idea of mestizaje that is um, lifted up in Elizondo's reading, for example, um, really comes from work already being done in Latin American studies where there's talk about Messe as this sort of lens and critical term. Um, now, more and more, scholars are, are pushing to mulates as the term because if we really want to talk about um, the, the marginalized, um, it is those who are mulatas that are the, the marginalized, um, representing the marginalized of, of Latin America. <clears throat> because, um, as you see in the social classes, to be, a, to be that dark, to be black, to have African blood is, um, puts you lower 
um, in the social classes or the racial classes and the way that power is distributed. Right, here is um, a map of, um, well, what we would think of as um, the United States um, before the U.S. had all of the land that it does today. Um, you'll see Texas there, a much larger, well, mostly it incorporates a lot of New Mexico, um, current day New Mexico as well, um, and a little bit of other areas but um, there. and then we move into the what I learned about as the Mexican-American War um, if you that's what I learned that's what I learned when I was in I don't know elementary school junior high um, really this was a U.S. invasion of Mexico uh, was not instigated by Mexico um, the U.S. invaded Mexican territory, the um, the Southwest, I think New Mexico, Arizona. They had taken Texas, which was independent at the time, but wanting to sweep across to, to the coast to have that whole territory, right, manifest destiny, go west, young man. Um, so they end up um, going and taking Mexico City deep in the heart of Mexico. When they take Mexico City, um, Mexico surrenders, and so they create a treaty through which the U.S. pays um, Mexico $15 million for, um, for all of the land of all of California, Nevada, Utah, um, Arizona, um, and actually the Gadsden Purchase, which is kind of a funny little thing. I don't know why they went back in and, and purchased the sort of tip of Arizona or Tucson, uh, basically. Um, but that occurred um, so that you have a map that looks like this. All right, so this map kind of shows um, all the dates and, and how um, that, you know, it was formerly the Republic of Texas. You see all of the area of Colorado was part of it, a little bit of Kansas, a little bit of Oklahoma and New Mexico. Um, and then with the invasion of Mexican territory and the taking of Mexico City, the U.S. was able to get um, Mexico to give up all of the rest of the Southwest for a few million dollars. So hopefully that you, now that you see that and maybe you already knew that history, you probably did, but maybe not putting it in this particular context, um, you'll see that the border crossed um, thousands of Mexican families and ranches um, of this was Mexico and, and Texas was Mexico uh, before it was Texas and then before it was part of the United States. So these are Mexican families, Mexican ranches, um, and the border just changes and crosses over them. So when you think about um, people who are Chicano or people who are Latina and Latino and have that heritage and, and names um, identifying with that Spanish and Mexican heritage, um, oftentimes white America thinks these must be immigrants and they must be immigrant families, not recognizing that their ancestors may have been here generations before our own white ancestors you know, arrived from Ireland and Eastern Europe and so on. So, um, you know, we, have, we really have to keep that in mind. Um, strangely, also, the, the border that was created, with the exception of 
basically the, the Texas um, border with Mexico, which is a river, uh, most of that border is totally artificial. Right? There's no natural boundary. So this is an extremely long border of unnatural boundary between a first world, if you will, and a third world, meaning a world a country that um, more economically developed and then a country that is more economically depressed. So obviously this becomes part of the immigration issue that we confront. I'm not just with Mexico, but from Guatemala, which um, has had horrible, awful violence throughout its history. So a lot of times um, immigrants that people think of as Mexican immigrants are actually Guatemalan immigrants who have immigrated all the way through Mexico um, to come across the Mexico border with America, but are not actually Mexican themselves. Uh, just to, again, to start to get an idea of how Mexicans started to be viewed, and you think that, you know, it wasn't, this was written in 1920, and the U.S. had not had the Southwest and the Pacific Southwest for all that long. Um, Daisy Machado, who this is taken from a, an essay by her, she is Tejana. Um, but right, so this is how the um, Disciples Church, um, their missionaries, thought about this Mexican problem, they say, is ever present with us. It is inescapable. The borderline between Mexico and the U.S. is 1,833 miles long. It is a political rather than a natural barrier and is therefore artificial and easily lost. The Christianization and Americanization of this, of this large body of alien people is a task of the whole church. So again, the Christianization and Americanization of this large body of alien people is a task of the whole church. You can see um, the anti-Mexican sentiment here. Um, the Chamber of Commerce um, being the sort of business um, establishment of a community um, doesn't want Mexicans in the country, um, say, during the Depression, right? Especially this image is from then. wanted to say a little bit about Puerto Rico because there seems to be a lot of confusion about the status of Puerto Rico. And I honestly cannot tell you the ins and the outs of this complicated um, status of Puerto Rico. Um, but it is um, important um, for our understanding of Latina theology and Latino theology in the United States, because it is part of the United States. It is not a state. Um, there's a lot of debate in Puerto Rico as to whether or not this, they even want um, to be a state. Um, there was recently a vote that was pretty split um, in Puerto Rico over the issue. Um, but nonetheless, um, the island, along with Guam and the Philippines, were taken from Spain as a result of the end of the Spanish-American War in 1898. So right at the turn of the century, um, the U.S. gained, um, took these islands, and you would have seen a little bit about this in one of the videos that I've had you watch so far, one of the um, race um, videos, the illusion um the story we tell. Um, it tells the story particularly of um, the Philippines, but Puerto Rico was also gained at that time. And it remains what is called an unincorporated territory. Um, Puerto Rico does not um, have representation in Congress. They do have a few delegates um, in the presidential 
nomination process and so on. Um, but they do not have representation in Congress. But yet, those born in Puerto Rico are natural-born citizens of the United States, just like anyone born um, in one of the 50 states. So Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens. Uh, so th there should be no confusion about that. Uh, the primary language in Puerto Rico is Spanish, though they also do speak English. Um, but it is part of the U.S. They are U.S. citizens, and yet Spanish is their primary language. Um, currently, Puerto Rico, if you are watching the news, um, Puerto Rico is in an extremely terrifying economic crisis. It's, a, again, a very complicated situation. I've considered put there's a very good educational video about what's happening. I've considered putting it up. Uh, maybe I will. Just um, in case you want to watch it, I'm not going to quiz you over it. It's about 30 minutes just to try to unpack why Puerto Rico is where it is. But it is terrifying to the point where hospitals can't pay their electric bills. And so they're just electric companies are shutting off power in hospitals. And um, the country really needs to declare well, the country. Uh, it's complicated. Um, Puerto Rico needs to declare bankruptcy, but that the right to declare bankruptcy, which every state in the union has, was taken away from Puerto Rico in the 80s, sort of inexplicably. It was hidden. It was put in this bill um, and got no publicity at the time. Nobody even seemed to be that aware that it was happening. Um but in the mid-80s, Puerto Rico lost its right to declare bankruptcy, which, which all states in the Union actually have, but Puerto Rico not being a state no longer has that. So it's um, in a terrible crisis right now. Um, part of the United States, um, but almost like sort of the neglected stepchild who isn't quite welcomed into the family, um, so this is part of the Latina and Latino context. All right, stepping back in time a little bit from our current, the current discussion in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico um, becoming part of uh, the U.S. territories in 1898. Um, but now, you know, we saw that slide from in the great era of the Great Depression, where it's like Mexicans, get out of here. Well, now in World War II, we have a labor crisis, um, which is why, like, my grandma was working, you know, in an airplane factory on the midnight shift, um, the third shift. She, she, and many other women joined the workforce during this time, although still needed more workers uh, because of all of the men who were overseas. At war, and so at this time, the U.S. started what is known as the Bracero Program, where Mexican laborers were brought in under um, workers' permits and workers' contracts to legally work uh, in the fields. There was still a very anti-Mexican, sort of racist image of them, and there was this idea that they were bringing in all these diseases. So they would spray these people down with DDT um, on the regular. Um, and here's an image of that. And there's this, this mass system. There's just this line of um, basically naked Mexican men being sprayed down from head to toe. Um, this it didn't end until 1962, long after the end of World War II. And one of the reasons it ended was because Mexican-Americans um, saw that this program, what it actually did was provide great profit to the farmers and growers, but kept laborers, citizens from, um, from better paying jobs, kept the wages low. Um, so whereas factory work um, in the, from the 40s into the 60s, wages had increased, um, field labor had not increased. Um, 
in the same margin. So famous Chicano and Chicana activists um, really wanted to bring an end to the Bracero program um, because it was allowing um, farms to keep wages very low. Um, famous, these the, the most famous activists at this time were Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez. Um, they co-founded um, the United Farm Workers Union, so the unionizing of um, farm workers, um, this beginning really in 1962. Um, they organized one of the most successful strikes um, during this time, the Delano Grape Strike. Um, when the Bracero program ended, Grape growers simply went to Filipino laborers, um, having, right, the Philippines had been incorporated, or maybe it remained unincorporated, but was a territory of the United States, um, and they were able to get Filipino workers in at very low wages. Um, and so the Filipino laborers were striking, and Chavez and Huerta um organized the whole union to strike with these Filipino workers and started to bring a lot of publicity to the really poor conditions and wages. And then churches, human rights activists and organizations, and others um, started to boycott um, wines that were grown by with these particular grapes, lettuce, table grapes and eventually there was pressure put enough pressure put on these companies because of mostly because of the bad publicity they were getting um, to raise wages some. Um, Cesar Chavez is also known for his hunger strikes, hunger strikes um, sort of following um, Gandhi's example to get um, attention placed on rights for um, workers here in the U.S. So I do want to say just a little bit about um, the situation for migrant workers in the United States. A very challenging um, way to live. Um, uh, this again, the hyperlinks don't work. I'll um, post the link in Blackboard. But the living conditions, there's many stories on the living conditions of migrant workers. You know, they, they're moving where the crops are being picked at the time, so they there is no permanent residence. Um, and so the conditions, you know, there will be sort of camps set up or a bunch of trailers that a lot of people share and cycle in and out of that are... Um, not well maintained. Oftentimes there's no plumbing, there's no water. Um, so the conditions are really um, inhumane even. Um, and then the pay is very, very low. Um, I have, there's another hyperlink here to an interview with a migrant worker who talks about getting paid 50 cents for every 32 pound bucket of tomatoes that he can pick, right? So when you're paying, you don't have to pay an hourly wage when you're paying by quantity like this, right? So if you'll pick, you know, 32 pounds of bucket of tomatoes, you know, I'll give you 50 cents. Well, imagine um, how long it takes to pick enough tomatoes to live on that wage. Um, another estimate says that men full-time Migrant workers make sixteen thousand dollars a year. Women only eleven. Um, one of the real concerns um, has to do with the exposure to pesticides and um, insecticides. There are images of migrant workers in the field working, picking while a crop duster flies over them, right, layering the crops with insecticides and pesticides while people are working in the fields. That is the kind of disregard 
there is for the life of these workers. Um, and then just the exposure, even just in the picking process, this is before these are washed, right? Think about how carefully you wash those apples because, you know, the apples are one of the, how they say is one of the most um, dangerous um, fruits and, and foods to eat um, because of all of the um, insecticides and pesticides. Um, you know, before you feed those to your children, how much you want to get those clean. Well, these people are working with their bare skin in just in these chemicals. Um, and it's very hard for families because of the um, moving constantly. Um, if you have a family, you have to take them, put them in a new school where you have to just pick up wherever, you know, wherever they are at this new school. And it becomes very challenging for children of migrant workers to ever graduate from high school because they are at so many different schools. Um, there's no cohesion of curriculum right so they're just bounced around and there's they just aren't able to ever um, build um, the knowledge so typically um, often they will also doubt um, I have posted a really amazing interview that one of my students did last semester with her mother who is Chicana um, and her family um, were migrant workers. And so she talks about the challenge of school um, a, a lot, as well as many other things like driving from, say, from, I think it was maybe Texas or somewhere in the south, driving to some crops in Michigan that they were picking in Michigan and that they had to go to the bathroom and they were stopping to find a uh, to go to the bathroom, but the, they, they wouldn't let them use the bathrooms because they had black bathrooms. So this is during the time of segregation, right? They had black bathrooms and they had white bathrooms, but they had no brown bathrooms, if you will. So they had to just go out in the field and go to the bathroom um, because there was no place for them. <clears throat> um, lastly here, I just wanted to highlight the danger um, for women migrant workers, especially for women who are undocumented workers. So these are women who are working, um, who are not here under legal workers' permits, don't have green cards and, um, or a workers' permit. The chances of them being sexually assaulted or being victim of some kind of sexual violence are very, very high because their overseers their managers in the fields know that they cannot, well, they, they feel that they can, and the women fear that they cannot press charges because they're not here legally, and so they fear deportation, and so they remain silent, and so they are absolutely vulnerable to this kind of violence. <clears throat> so I cite two studies here. Um, one found that 60% of the workers interviewed, the women workers, had experienced some form of sexual harassment or sexual violence. Um, another um, found that almost all of the workers interviewed had suffered um, sexual violence of some, f some sort at work. Um, and one worker calling it, qu quite famously actually, a field of panties because of, um, yeah, that's obvious. We're going to look at a few um, forms of legislation that have come through a variety of states that is specifically targeting Latinos in the United States. Um, so the first I'll mention is, was known as Prop 187. This was passed in California in the 1990s. And its purpose was to prohibit illegal immigrants from using healthcare, education, or other social services in the state of California. Um, so this means that 
children could not go to school and um, illegal immigrants could not use any kind of emergency health services. Now, if I'm visiting in Mexico, um, I don't need a visa to go visit Mexico. And if I get sick, I hope to God I can use their health care. Um, but this was um, to deny them even being able to come to the hospital and so on. Um, it passed, actually, um, but the federal court found it was unconstitutional, so it did not um, ultimately last in California. Another California proposition, this is um, Prop 209, um, was sort of an anti-affirmative action bill. This was um, retained in the books. Um, this changed the state constitution to make it unconstitutional for any state or public agency or institution, including um, the state um, university system or the UC system, to give preferential treatment based upon race, class, color, ethnicity, nationality, country of origin, or sex. Um, so this has to do with college admissions, which um, we could you know, kind of do a, a whole lecture on. There's been a lot of um, talk about this in the news in the past 10 years or so, and very recently it's before the Supreme Court based upon a case in um, Texas and the University of Texas system. Um, so it's at the Supreme Court level right now. Um, but um, this says that you can't say if you're calculating admissions, um, you can't give a point, an extra point, for someone being a minority of some form. Um, this could be, um, we have a professor here at St. Ambrose who, who tells the story of how his daughter got into the University of Chicago and he says she got in because of affirmative action, because they want to have um, people from a diverse um, locales, if you will. So she is from rural Iowa, so um, where the pop you know the population is is much lower. So she's from this small uh, rural Iowa town, and that was attractive um, at the University of at the University of Chicago, where they wanted to diversify, not just have people from cities or metropolitan areas, but diversify. Well, that is a private institution, a public institution, in California anyways, would not be able to um, give preferment to in an attempt to diversify the student body. Um, Michigan um, has since passed a similar amendment to the Constitution. There was a lot of concern at the University of Michigan and Ann Arbor about this. And, um, you know, well, so many people think that, especially the California one, was really targeted to let the Latina population. Um, in Michigan, it might be a different minority population, but there it is nonetheless. The most famous uh, anti-Hispanic or anti-Latino legislation was um, passed in Arizona. Um, it was called the Arizona Act. Um, this made it a misdemeanor crime for an immigrant to be in Arizona without carrying documents on their person at all times. So it's it's not just targeting illegal immigrants. It's also <laughs> targeting any immigrant. You had to have your papers on you at all times. Um, and it required state law enforcement officers to attempt to determine someone's immigration status during what was called a lawful stop, detention, or arrest, or during any lawful contact. Um, that is extremely broad. Um, so it, basically it was trying to turn state law enforcement officers into, you know, um, ICE agents, or, uh, immigration um, agents, um, which is not their job. 
but it made it a crime, made it a misdemeanor to not be carrying it. So it sort of created it um, to be under the purview of, of state police. Um, well, this um, has had a, a lot of publicity. I'm actually going to post another link. Goodness, you're going to be linked out. But um, it's a Colbert report where he talks about this and shows some clips of people debating this issue. Um, one of the links that I posted from um, What Would You Do? The second What Would You Do? link begins with people from Arizona calling in and saying, well, you need to come to Arizona and see what a problem it is here, and then maybe you'd have a different take. Um, so they do. They go to Arizona. But um, parts of this bill were found unconstitutional, and so they were overturned um, at the federal level, at the Supreme Court level. Um, the issues around um, discrimination of Latinos in the United States is getting more and more uh, publicity right now because of the current political climate um, that we're in. Um, notice um, the use of the word alien in a lot of discourse around immigrants. It's a way to keep the viewer, the listener, the public from considering them fellow human beings, right? The word alien anymore really denotes otherness, foreignness, not like us, right? To be alien is to be not like us. I mean, that's why we call them aliens from outer space, right? That's something so foreign, something not like us. So the use of the word alien rather than, you know, immigrant, you know, is um, is a choice and it's an intentional decision made to keep othering um, different populations. There's also a revival of this phrase anchor baby. Um, was shocked to find um, Jeb Bush even using the term he once previously in the past had said that it was a really offensive term, but once Donald Trump, who was the forerunner and um, now the nominee, most likely, um, he started using it, um, anchor babies. This is the idea, absurd idea, that a Latina will come into the United States and intentionally have babies so that they will be citizens and she will be allowed to stay in the U.S. And so they will be her anchor, right? So she'll be able to stay. Not the case. They will deport her and her kids back and they will be able to return to the States um, when they're 18. So it doesn't really work that way, but um, there is this notion. And so it's a really anti Latina, specifically targeting Latina, suggesting that they're just coming here to have babies, right? So again, it's just really like sexualizing them. They're just breeding um, really negative stereotypes targeting Latinas. Um, <clears throat> obviously, there's all this talk about building a wall. Remember how many miles long, <laughs> thousand and some miles long the border is with Mexico, um, this talk about building an impenetrable high wall, um, and then even talk about denying citizenship to children born in the U.S. whose parents were not born here. So this is changing the way it has been done in the United States since the beginning, denying natural-born citizenship. Um, and that is being talked about um, in some campaigns. This has had um, a real impact um, in our culture um, and even amongst young people. So I want to highlight um, just a few instances that occurred in the spring of 2016 at two basketball games. And I'm sure there's other examples, but these stuck out to me. One, because they're in the Midwest and one even in here in Iowa. Um, this first one that I'll mostly focus on, this is the one in Indiana. It took place when two Catholic high school basketball teams are playing each other. 
so that, that kind of got to me that these are Catholic schools, right? So there's these are Christians, a Christian, students at a Christian institution who are being trained and, and taught in the Christian faith. Um, one um, school came to the game and they were playing against a team that is largely Hispanic. The population of the school is um, more, much more Hispanic than um, so than Adrian, which is the school that came dressed, you see, in red, white, and blue. Um, now their team is representative of the USA, apparently, obviously, suggesting that the other team is not representative of the USA. Um, the reports say that um, there were obviously Trump heads and um, also Dora the Explorer um, signs. Um, there was a big sign for ESPN Desportes, so their sports channel. Um, there's a Hispanic character on Family Guy. There was also a big cutout of him and then just general um, Trump signs, as well as sort of, right, that we're all Americana, we've got the American flag, and so on. They were chanting at the other team and at the other fans, USA, um, again, suggesting that they aren't American, right? Um, chanting, build that wall, chanting, speak English, and no comprende, as well as, um, as well as chanting Trump which is what happened at this Iowa basketball game. Um, one of the teams was predominantly white. One of the teams was, um, and school is almost 50% Hispanic. So at this basketball game also, they um, brought Trump signs and were chanting build a wall, chanting USA and chanting Trump. Um, so Trump has become for some really um, a figure of get the Latinos out of out of the U.S. Um, and whether or not I'm not going to weigh in on his intention, but regardless of what he wants, um, the way that his image is being used, obviously, um, by some, is in an anti-Hispanic um way and even in anti-black ways as well but this example is specifically targeting Latinos and this is again young people um, we oftentimes like to think that oh young people in the U.S. today they're so much more tolerant they're you know we've come so far um, but I think we see again and again that really we haven't and um, we have a long way to go. We're going to close this lecture today by looking at specifically the proposals, the theological proposals of Virgilio Elizondo. Um, he's quite famous for his book, The Galilean Journey, uh, Mexican-American Promise. You have um, a reading of just an essay um, where he walks through some of the work that he does in this larger book. Um, he of course, sees Mexican-Americans as mestizos, not just because of Mexican understood as being mestizo, being, you know, Indian and Spanish, but he sees Mexican-Americans as mestizo because they have this Mexican heritage and ancestry, but they're also American, truly American. So there is an American identity and a Mexican identity mixed and culturally mixed. Um, and so he talks about Jesus and Jesus's upbringing and his experience in Galilee as being an experience of mestizaje, an experience of the mixing of cultures, the mixing of language, and the discrimination that one receives when one is mixed and not sort of pure. So in the Mexican-American experience, according to Elizondo, this is being not purely Mexican. You're not Mexican enough for the Mexicans. You're certainly not white enough for white American culture. So um, you experience that sort of discrimination for being a mixture. You're not enough of either. Um, and he sees this 
in Jesus's experience, because he came from Galilee, and Elizondo quotes um, the line from the Bible when someone refers to Jesus, didn't he come from Nazareth? You know, nothing good is expected from Galilee. Um, so Jesus coming from Galilee, coming from this um, remote region far from Jerusalem, um, at the crossroads of the Roman Empire. So it, it's sort of a metropolitan area in that there was, uh, it was a major crossroads. So there's lots of people journeying through Rome, passing through there, but that's part of what makes it a mixture, right? So that Jesus was exposed to many languages and many cultures. And this is why, according to Elizondo, that Jerusalem Judaism and, and those from Jerusalem and which is the center of Jewish worship, would look down on people from Galilee, such as this quote, nothing good is expected from Galilee. That's, that's a, a, you know, a Jewish person responding to Jesus because Jesus's ministry was amongst the Jewish population. So um, being far, being removed, that the idea was um, sort of the stereotype of the Galilean Jew was that they didn't know the law as well as people in Jerusalem did. Their religion wasn't as pure. Their, their language wasn't as pure. And maybe even, maybe even there was a mixing of blood or a biological mestizaje, um, which would have been um, very, uh, very bad, basically, in that culture. Um, in Jewish culture at that time, say, so if Jesus wasn't um, fully Jewish, if he didn't have a Jewish mother and a Jewish father, right, and then it's kind of this suspicion around him, well, um, you know, we know who his mother is, but, you know, is Joseph really his father, right? So um, he experiences the discrimination that would be levied at people who are from this region because they're not pure enough. So he talks about Jesus as being mestizaje, being able to identify with that rejection that Elizondo talks about in this reading um, of experiencing that kind of rejection um, culturally. And Elizondo makes a lot of this in um, the reading. He talks about um, the experience of rejection. And that Jesus, right, is rejected. Jesus is rejected all the way to the cross, right? The world rejects him and says, we don't want you, and throws him out of the world on the cross. Um, but Jesus comes to tear down those kinds of separation. Um, and he even talks about how on the through the resurrection, God overcomes human rejection, the the pain of human rejection. Um, Jesus is crucified because he questioned the authority of those in the centers of power. Um, Elizondo, do this reading carefully. I think it's a really outstanding reading. He talks about why Jesus had to go to Jerusalem. You know, his ministry had to take him to Jerusalem because that is where the center of power was. And he had to front and question the centers of power that these people in, in these positions have the power and have the authority. And he questions their authority, right? And you think back to the preferential option for the poor, the epistemological privilege um, that some of our authors talk about. That meaning the epistemological privilege says that the people on the outskirts, the people on the margins, have a closer understanding to, to the desire of God in Christ. Um, that their perspective, we need to try to get in alignment with them so that we can see better the ways of God. So that's what the epistemological privilege means. And so people in centers of power, you know, in, in the top theological institutions, for example, if we were to translate that into our day, that they don't have the best perspective, right? So questioning that authority and saying, no, it is, it is the mestizai, it is the people on the outskirts, the people on the margins that have um, the privileged perspective in the ways of God. 
Um, here's a quote from Elizondo. God's love in and through Jesus triumphs over all the divisive hatreds and consequent violence of humanity. In a resurrecting Jesus, God rejects the rejection of humanity, demolishes the idolized structures. It is from the resurrection that the entire way of Jesus and every aspect of his life takes on a liberating and salvific significance. So here Elizondo places the, the saving significance of Jesus's work, not so much in that Jesus dies on the cross, which is what we're used to saying in theology, right? It's not so much that Jesus suffers and dies. That shows us what happens when you challenge centers of power, right? Jesus's death is, a cons is the consequence of him going to Jerusalem from the margins, from Galilee, and questioning power of the elites, questioning the authority of those in the center. That is what sends him out onto the cross, according to Elizondo, and he is rejected, right? God resurrects him, and it is in the resurrection that we see the liberation and the saving work of God in Christ is unleashed. And it is in that, that that God rejects the rejection. It is in that that um, the the idolized structures of power and privilege in our society are demolished. And Jesus is offering, is able to offer salvation and liberation to everyone. Then in conclusion, Elizondo talks about mestizaje as, um, as the future um, because it is from the frontier regions. It is from these, these marginal regions on the outside right, where there is the mixing. It is there that, that God calls the new creation, like with Jesus being from Galilee. right? That's where the new creation is emerging and thus, the future is mestizo, the future, the kingdom of God. We talked um, in a recent lecture about eschatology, the hope of the future, heaven, hell, paradise, what is to come, the reign of God, the kingdom of God. That is mestizo, uh, according to Elizondo. But the reason for that is because it will be a, a mixture of all becoming one together, right? All of these races mixing to become a new people, that is the people of God. Um, the new identity, the real identity is Christ, that we are one in Christ, that we are the people of God, not that you are Mexican, I am American, or I am from Ireland, and you are from Guatemala, but that together we are actually the people of God. And that's the, what our identity truly is in Christ, not um, our skin tone. Yeah. Lastly, um, we're not going to get to go into all of these um, different themes that run throughout Latino and Latina theology. Again, we could have a whole class just on Latin American and Latino and Latina theology, and there are courses that specific um, offered um, at different institutions. But I just want to highlight some of these are mentioned in the Davila reading. Um, first, the border um, and ways of talking about the border um, become very important to Latino and Latina theology. Notice that um, you have a poem from Gloria Anzaldúa called um, On the Borderlands, a book on the borderlands um, by, um, by Gloria Anzaldúa. So this sort of border existence, which we also find there in this idea of being mestizaje um, in the Elizondo reading, and my discussion question for you this week has to do with comparing the experience of mestizaje and Elizondo's readings about the Mexican-American experience with this borderlands idea and that borderlands poem. So I'm not going to say too much because I want you to, to really think about those connections and, and put that up on your discussion board. Nepantla is a word from Nahuatl. So it is um, 
indigenous to Mexico and to the Aztec um, spirituality and people there. And Nampantla also means is the middle. So it has to do with, um, well, in a sense, that would be kind of like the border, but, but the middle, um, and it's often comes up in Latina theology and spirituality um, as being a between between state or um, between place. Um, Mestizaje, obviously, I do want to highlight um, the Davila reading on Mestizaje. She talks about it a lot throughout her essay. Um, notice that while she still encourages its use as being sort of a unique contribution, she wants to remind us that while it could be very positive to use because it really describes the Mexican-American experience or because it really describes the mixing of blood and cultures that is um, so much a part of Mexican identity, she's concerned of its just sort of romanticization or its just uncritical embrace um, because it is a forced mestizaje um, initially by conquest and rape, right? The mixing of Indian and Spanish blood was largely a product of the rape of indigenous women and the giving of women slaves to Spanish conquerors. Um, so we have to be careful, right, in our use of the term that we don't just forget about the violence that brought about these mixing of cold mixings of blood. Lo Cotidiano refers to the daily life, daily living, the everyday life, um, specifically of Latinas and Latinos. Um, she again thinks this is really good if, if we remain true to Lo Cotidiano, if we really are doing um, theology of the people. <coughs> um, that's great. But she also, again, doesn't want to romanticize too much um, unless we realize that Lo Cotidiano also includes great suffering. So sort of the daily life isn't just about the fiesta. It isn't just a celebration of life, though there is that. Um, there is also great suffering. So we have to remember to keep that um, in place. And so that's why she's talking about Latino and Latina theology it has to continue to critique militarism, it has to continue to critique um, racism in the country and so on, because this is producing great suffering. Um, another term um, is Teología de Conjunto, um, theology together. Right? So doing theology together um, rather than just sort of this individualistic way of doing theology, but doing theology um, in community, really in community. Uh, um, Our Lady Guadalupe, obviously. Um, Davila refers to her as La Morenita. Uh, La Morenita, the, the Again, sort of the dark virgin, as I referenced earlier. <clears throat> there is a focus on praxis. This was something that was referenced in our my introductory lecture on Latin American liberation theology, which has greatly influenced Latino and Latina theology. Praxis, this refers to action, right? I talked about orthopraxis, um, right action, right practice, the doing of the work, the doing of justice that the gospel calls us to. Obviously, the preferential option for the poor, which your um, Gutierrez reading was all on this, what this means, um, and unpacking that, and she referenced it as well, it is throughout um, Latina and Latino theologies. Religión popular, um, this refers to popular religion or the religion of the people. How are people practicing religion? Um, and really looking not just at what are what are the top theologians at the top research institutions at the top theological academies? What are they saying Christianity is? Not just listening to the people in the ivory towers, the educated elites, and, and they get to define what Christianity is or what Catholicism is today, but looking at how the people, the devout people, are actually practicing their religion. So so some of the work on Our Lady of Guadalupe, for example, would really be looking at um, the prayers of the people, the devotion of the people to Our Lady of Guadalupe, for example. So not just looking at 
at academic theology as being the definition of Catholicism today, but how is it practiced in the homes, in the streets, in the community, in the village, and looking at that as um, the embodiment of Catholicism today. And that's um, a place where we look to derive our theologies, not just in the books. Uh, again, Fiesta um, came up. Your um, Elizondo reading also, Davila mentions it. And I'm going to conclude with Fiesta, just bringing it back to the Gutierrez reading. Um, when he talks about solidarity, Gutierrez talks about friendship. There is no solidarity without friendship. He, and he talks about friendship as um, opening oneself up, um, sharing. You don't you don't share with someone who isn't your friend necessarily. You might give sort of charitably, you know, you, here's some alms for the poor or something, but that's not sharing. So sharing has to do with sharing your home, sharing yourself, opening yourself up in friendship. Um, and this relates um, to Fiesta here because he talks about the last line of um, the reading about the laughter of the poor will clasp you around the waist. Right? He wants to remind us that, um, that the poor are truly people, are humans, giving a face to this sort of blanket term of the poor. You know, on a, the last lecture, I gave stat after stat after stat about the billions of poor. How do we um, get in touch with humanity of the poor? And rather than just thinking of them as with pity, um, as the poor need our, need our pity and need our charity, but he talks about the complex lives of the poor. What do they do in the spare time that they may have? What hobbies, right? Um, and Davila challenges this so much. He says, well, you know, when they're working three jobs, there isn't a lot of time for hobbies. But Gutierrez wants to remind us that there are full, complete lives of love and laughter and senses of humor and jokes and sharing and giving. He talks about the woman that anoints um, Jesus with that oil and the disciples say, oh, that should have been sold and given to the poor. And Gutierrez wants to remind us that the poor have gifts to give. Right? The poor have things to share and to give. They have full, complete lives, complex lives. Um, and they celebrate. They have parties. And they laugh. So I want to end with that. And, and yes, yeah, sort of holding that intention with the Davila critiques. Um, but that this is, um, these are all parts of, of the contribution that Latino and Latino theology are making to the broad discipline of Christian theology today.